good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Differentiation for Adult Learners. Our webinar is both sponsored by and presented by Essential Education, and our presenters today are Dan Griffith. He's the president of the Educator Division with Essential Education, and Jen Denton. She is the director of Educational Development. Please say hello and welcoming them by saying hello from the, in the chat box. Let us know where you're calling in from today. If you have questions during the presentation, you can submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Am I showing the right screen, Jen? Do I have the right screen showing? You are. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little worried because it doesn't have the little green line around it. Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to have you all here today and to have this opportunity to share this presentation with you uh, through the CoAve venue. Um, we love our partnership with CoAve and thanks James for that introduction and the chance to do this. Um, just real quickly, to give you a little frame of reference for what you're gonna see today. So, um, you know, a lot of us have, have learned about differentiation in a variety of uh, formats in the past. Um, maybe some of you have been K-12 teachers, some of you have come in from different uh, types of teaching where you took courses in differentiation. And so our goal today is just first to kind of reintroduce it from an adult ed perspective and give you a little framework for how differentiation maybe differs or is uh, becomes more complex with adult learners. And then secondly, we're going to show you some how-tos. We've got uh, some cool things that we've developed that um, we're gonna provide to you that will help you think about how you can greater differentiate instruction in your classroom. And then finally, we're gonna give you access to a guide that Jen put together. It's a 65 page guide on differentiating instruction specifically for adult learners. It's totally free. It is a phenomenal guide that gives you templates and tools that you can use day in and day out in the classroom. And ultimately, though, you're going to need to dig into that guide. You're going to have to, I mean, we can't in an hour go through everything that we need to, but you're going to have access to it. Again, it's free and um, you'll be able to really dig in and learn more about things that you can do. And some of these tools that, that Jen developed that will make it easier for you to differentiate on a regular basis. So that's the plan for today, just to give you that frame of reference. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. And I think we're gonna turn off our videos. You guys know we're live human beings now. And um, if you have questions or whatever, we'll both be monitoring the chat window and, and do our best when one of us is talking, the other one will be looking at the, <laughs> looking at the chat. So uh, we look forward to that. Make sure your uh, two button says uh, to everyone and not just hosts and panelists. You wanna make sure that everybody can see your comments. All right, with that, Jen, you're off and running. We are. So we wanted just to get everybody kind of on the same page here in the beginning, because as Dan mentioned, you know, we've all kind of got different experiences when it comes to differentiation. Um, some of us have dove into the deep end, so to speak, and we've been well-versed and tons of different techniques and others of us may be only getting our feet wet in this. So we wanted to start kind of leveling the playing field in this overall definition for differentiation specific to adult learners. So differentiated instruction is then the intentional planning and presentation of instruction to promote the progress and performance. Those, as we know, are two very different things, progress and performance of a diverse group of learners. And we really encourage you as you dig into some of these key words within this definition to realize that this is a rich and a really layered concept because effective differentiation must be intentional with that thoughtful purpose, beginning with that end in mind concept. It does require planning and pre-design to get something or someone to accomplish that goal. It, involves careful consideration, not only of lesson presentation and delivery, but then the instruction, imparting that information that's being delivered. And educators must take into account that that individual progress or movement, growth, development, or continuous improvement of each student, as well as their ability to meet these predetermined standards of academic performance, 
all of this must be accomplished then in a very diverse with a variety of social, cultural, economic groups, a number of people that are related in one way, they're adult students, but not always because those learners are individuals looking to acquire knowledge and skills that are deeply personal and they have deeply rooted value. So when we look at the differentiated classroom, it's often been described in many informal ways over the years. So Dan's gonna take us through a few of those kind of slang terms for differentiated instruction within the adult classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some of these might speak to you and some might not. We're interested when we get to the end of the list, if there's one on the list that really kind of um, gives you the mental image of what your classroom has been like or is like. Uh, we often talk about it as a melting pot. You have a lot of different types of uh, individuals in there with different backgrounds. Uh, some people have thought about it as tailored clothes, things that have different parts of them uh, that fit in different ways. Um, a sports team, of course, you know, you have different positions that do different things that have different uh, elements to them, but they all contribute to the team being successful. You can think of your classroom as a family, right? I, I had five kids and no two of them are that much alike. It's, it's strange to think that they all came out of the same parents, but, um, you know, a family has a lot of different blending and, uh, and different attributes to it. Uh, of course, a community, um, small or, or large, um, a shoe store. I love that example, you know, because you think about all the different types of shoes in a shoe store and and the different uh, purposes and goals that each shoe has and the way they fit and the sizes and all the different attributes to that. And then uh, I'm not a big jazz fan, but sometimes I talk about it as a jazz ensemble as well. So if one of those really speaks to you as to how you think about your differentiated classroom, your, your group of students that you're working with, uh, throw it in the chat window. We're interested in what kind of rises to the top out of that list for you. Yeah, we've got community popping up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like shoe store too and families. The shoe store of students. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> they all have to walk, but they don't have to walk in the same shoes, right? And it's different sizes and styles. Like mosaic. And that's a new one too. Oh, I do like that. And a bouquet. That's a great oh. one. Too. Yeah. Awesome. Orchestra. Great. Salad right. united by the dressing. That's one we haven't heard yet. <laughs> I think that makes the teacher the dressing. I think so. I think yeah. so. Well, hey, as we dive into differentiation, we always like to start with the why. I, I do it when I work with students and, and as well as when we do professional development with teachers, because we can take it back to the truth that when we understand why we need to learn something, it, it means more. And it really is because there's a lot of research to support that teaching to the middle just doesn't work. And we're going to look at some expert commentary here in regard to this concept. The word differentiation needs to be more than a word, not just something we say to sound smart in meetings. I am very passionate about that. I, I think I could go a long time without talking in acronyms or hearing another acronym. So I think that we've got to get to, yes, we have to understand the research and the the dialogue and everything behind these big concepts, but we need the practical steps. We need these feet to the ground concepts. And here, I believe Dan was, she called the queen last week. Carol Ann yeah. Tomlinson was referred yeah. to as the queen of differentiation. She has a great article, how to differentiate in academically diverse questions. And I love the heart of this. We differentiate instruction to honor the reality of the students that we teach. I love that, to honor the reality, the busy lives, the negative past educational experiences, lack of preparation, the desire to be and do more within that student population. We differentiate to identify and meet students where they are. And then of course we have this wonderful resource from Go Ape Journal and Don Finn gave us this wonderful insight. I discovered that even the most engaged students perform poorly on assessments and that my one size fits all approach was not working. 
So where do we go from here? If we see the reality of this why, let's start with what we know about differentiation for adult learners. Well, we know that it's complex. Just like the problem in itself is complex, the demographic that we're working with is complex. Adult learners vary in age and race and socioeconomic level. They vary in ability and skill and personal goals, religious, cultural, and language background differences, life and educational experience, as well as identity, value systems, and beliefs. And, and as we see, learning preferences and differences. And all of these factors, and I'm sure you could list tons more in the chat. We had a wonderful chat conversation around this topic recently, and so many um, engaged educators were really saying, hey, what about this? What about this difference? What about this factor? These individuals and all their complexities are looking to us as adult educators for instruction and for guidance. What else do we know, Dan? Well, we know it's challenging, right? All the good stuff in life is always hard, it seems like. <laughs> um, it, it was that one quote from uh, League of Their Own. He says, it's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody do it. The hard is what makes it great. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a lot of variables that are in the mix for you, um, like Jen just talked about. And that's a, that's a tall order, even no matter how long you've been educating. Um, one of the quotes that uh, the report from Massachusetts Department of Education uh, we drew out was that teachers or directors, teachers and advisors identified differentiation as a key strategy for student success and requested support for providing it. Assistance with best practices for differentiation was a common additional support requested by directors and teachers. And why is really for that? It, it's just a difficult thing to do. It's not as easy as just kind of painting a one size fits all. You have to really dig in and you have to do some of that extra work. But what we need is something that's scalable. You need some approaches that you can implement day in, day out in the classroom and do on a regular basis that will enhance your ability to engage students because of all the things that can really make a difference in how a student learns, differentiation has to be at the top of the list. And so, you know, you have this kind of two ends of the spectrum. It's super hard, well, not super hard, but it's difficult to do on the one hand, but it's the most important thing you could do on the other hand. So we got to find a way to scale it and make that happen. So um, I think this is you, Jen. I think you get to talk about some of the roadblocks. It is, you know, as we look at it, you know, we, we don't want to go down this negative path here in the beginning and talk about all the challenges, but as we often realize, we, we have to acknowledge those challenges. We have to acknowledge those roadblocks if we want to find ways to move past them, you know, and that's the sentiment hopefully that we pass on to our students and that we can model that type of perseverance. So let's acknowledge some of the things that are roadblocks to that effective differentiation because they, they are abundant. We've got lack of time. We've got inefficient resources or limited access to those differentiated materials. We very often have very little time to collaborate and there's sometimes difficulty in creating those resources, even when we have the time. Many folks have noted that they don't feel like they have effective training in this particular area. And I don't even have to explain the last one, teacher tired. <laughs> Everybody here knows what teacher tired is. We can only extend ourselves so much. And so sometimes it feels like, oh my goodness, it's just one more thing to consider and one more thing to do add one thing that kind of plays on that teacher tire, but for me, it's because I'm getting older. And frankly, I just can't hold as much information, it seems like, in my mind as I used to. You know, you walk to you walk to the next room and you're like, what did I come in here for? I can't, I can't remember why, I, you know, walked 10 steps for this room. But if you think about differentiation of the instruction that you give. The ideal student to teacher ratio is probably a one to one or one to two. You can make the case that one to one is the best because you have just that absolute, you know, one on one connection. I think you can make a case for one to two, 
where um, you can have as a teacher, you can have students do some things together that allow them some cognitive dissonance, some disagreement, some back and forth that maybe you wouldn't get in a one-to-one -one situation. So I think we can all agree that those are going to be really idealistic situations if you are trying to teach another human being anything. So the question is, as you add more and more students, your ability to hold all of that information that, that makes differentiation important. You know, if I'm just working one-on-one -on -one with a student, I know their favorite color, I know their favorite food and what sports they like and what their goals are and what they wanna do. Maybe at one to two, I can still hold that, maybe three. But at what point do you lose the ability to hold enough information in your head to be nimble on your feet and adjust examples and ideas and content to meet the needs of those students. I'd be curious in the chat window, what you think, what's kind of the class size where you suddenly say, you know what, like ideally we, we kind of talked about where's the point where your brain says, no, at one to eight, I'm kind of done. That's about as much as I'm probably gonna be able to hold uh, information wise. And it'd just be fun to see some of those comments in the chat. <laughs> Um, yeah, five to seven, five. Some of you, you know, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, um, but it's interesting to think about where that could be uh, in the limit uh, before we start to see a, a, a demise in the ability to differentiate effectively. And truthfully, you know, if you're teaching, you know, if you're trying to move a lot of students through, sometimes you just don't have that choice of what that number really is. Seeing a lot of 15s, kind of that five to 10 numbers uh, popping out pretty regularly as well. And then you think about your class load and you say, okay, so I need something. I need some tools that can help me get to these numbers that I actually have on a daily basis and, uh, and make it work. Anything to add to that, Jim? I just love to see, okay, this is the ideal. I love this one to five. We're seeing anywhere from one to five to I think the highest was 15. Yeah. what's your real class load like? I'd yeah. love to see what, what the height of some of those numbers folks are, are dealing with. So maybe, maybe put an RC number in there, your real class load that you have. Because as we talk about what comes next, the what now, to this end, our team realizes, hey, we, we yeah, we, we would function really well if we were one to five or if we were, you know, one to three or one to 10, whatever your, you kind of resonate with there. But look at those numbers that are popping up, 22, yeah. 35, 48. So what now? We're, we're left with this what now? And to this end, our team here at Essential Education would like to suggest a new model for differentiated instruction based on three tenets that Dan and I are going to go over today at a high level. But as he mentioned at the beginning of our time together today, we're going to put what we feel is a very, very real, very practical resource in your hand to walk through these elements. So based on these three tenets, discover, design, and do, we hope to give you a different perspective on differentiation today. Great. Right. So let's start with discover. Um, you know, as you think about what it means to differentiate the instruction you're giving to students, to me, it's always about what are those personal things that I can do on the fly with students sometimes, sometimes very planned and intentional, but even sometimes just on the fly to be able to, to say to someone, I know your goal is to get a welding certificate. So let's talk about these angles that you're gonna use on an everyday basis. That's because that's their personal professional interest. And so you need to have these things. If you're really gonna differentiate instruction well, you need to in essence assess who they are, what those things are. It allows you to build relationships with them. It allows you to be nimble in your teaching. It enhances your discussions in the classroom. Um, it's often a small investment on your part, but with a big payoff down the line. So knowing those personal and professional interests, understanding their learning profile, what is their background in learning? What, uh, what pace works for them? What does their culture have to do or what impact does it have with uh, learning? What about their learning styles? I know, you know, some people uh, have questioned the kind of uh, auditory 
visual kinesthetic models, but I think there's still relevance to those. People do still, I know I always identify myself as a visual learner very much. I need to see certain things for, for it to click in my head. And then your readiness. What are those educational and experiential ex uh, parts of, of each person that are often transferable skills that move you or prepare you for whatever that learning is that you need to accomplish in your life. And so these, you know, this whole section of a book is designed to help you discover what students, who they are, what these interests, profiles, and readiness levels are, so you can integrate that into what you're doing in the classroom. And we had a great question come up in the chat, Dan, just saying, you know, hey, what level of adult learners are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, kind of a, a lower level uh, student that's not even quite ready for GED or high set test prep? Are we talking about those HSE students? Or are we talking about those that are a little bit higher? And I, I think the beauty of differentiation is it's all of the above. You know, we, we mentioned earlier that a lot of these concepts, they, they have a grounding in K-12 education. But what takes on new life as an adult is this section that Dan is just talking about, because they have personal and professional differences that are way different than a K-12 student would have. Some of them may have some hurts or some trauma from that K-12 environment that they bring in that then affects their learning profile and their educational and their experiential readiness. So I think it's an all of the above that depending on your group, discovering more about your students really starts to shape that dynamic. Absolutely. So let's talk about design, Jen. Yeah, so as we move into design, we kind of titled this Envision New Instructional Possibilities because here's the deal. If we want to, as educators, create effective instruction, we have to plan it. As a classroom teacher, you may not have been, quite honestly, a part of the curriculum selection process but you are the CEO, like it or not, of its execution. And in designing effective differentiated instruction, there are three constant considerations that we need to make. And that is looking at the content itself, the process, and then the product. And we're going to break these down a little bit. Any research, anything you look at with differentiation, you're going to see these tenets, content, process, and product, but we want to flesh it out, help it to make a little bit more sense. So the content is what students learn, and this can be both the complexity and the content itself. And the content component of instruction is that what, and this includes both the subject level of difficulty, the robust nature of the curriculum, as well as the context and the topics and the breadth of information to be covered. And that content also includes how the student will access that information. Access is a big word right now, especially in making accommodations for those with learning differences. And in all practicality, the foundation of that curriculum, the content in adult education classrooms typically correlate to the standards set forth by the district or the program leadership. However, the varied needs of the adult classroom that we've already just touched a bit on today require that curriculum to be layered or scaffolded to effectively meet students at their current level and provide support for growth. So that's where we then start to look at the process, how students learn, the delivery and the division. The process component differentiation rests in the how. And many educators take this to mean addressing individual student learning styles like auditory, visual, or kinesthetic. And there's some back and forth here. We could probably have a whole separate discussion about this. Many people firmly believe that none of us have one particular learning style that we kind of ebb and flow between a mix or maybe we have a, a specific go-to with one subject or one topic, but maybe something totally different with the other. But I think we can all land on and agree that multi-sensory instruction is key. It seeks to engage the senses in order to more effectively activate the brain on multiple levels. 
So when designing differentiated instruction, thoughtful educators will try to challenge themselves to find and implement instructional elements that engage those senses over the course of the activity. Which then brings us to the product, how the students show what they have learned. And this is where we get to talk about process and performance. Don't get Dan and I started on how much we, we stand behind the value of effort-based goals because that, that is really uh, something that both of us lean into when we think about what really matters in building a student experience, the progress, the effort that they put into things, getting them to see those little benchmarks is so, so important. So this third aspect of differentiated instruction comes in considering how students will demonstrate what they have learned. And this often involves using program-based assessments, tests and quizzes and formal assignments to record that student performance. But it also includes finding creative ways to monitor student progress and growth all the time. The ability to evaluate, quantify and celebrate individual student growth is essential in the ABE classroom. Adult students need to see that their efforts matter. We know this. We know this about adult learners. They need to see the bang for their buck, so to speak. They need to know that the investment that they're making of their time and their energy and their resources is taking them closer to their goals in practical ways. It's often referred to recently as just in time learning versus just in case learning. I don't want to learn something that's really abstract just in case I might need it down the road. I want to learn for just in time so I can use it in a timely manner. And this isn't always adequately and I would say rarely measured in something as cut and dry as a test score. Awesome. So we've looked at discovering interests, learning profiles, readiness. We've now looked at when you're designing, you need to think through content, process, product. And then when you actually enact your plan, when you go in the classroom and you do, you're going to need to have thought through your materials, your observations, and your feedback. And so this is, you know, typical teaching that you're familiar with, but I think you have to, you have to tweak it a little bit if your goal is to differentiate instruction in the end. So your materials oftentimes can change. Maybe you're doing something where you're using different leveled content for different learners in the classroom. Um, there's a great site, many of you I'm sure are familiar with New Zealand uh, or New ZLA, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but you can get the same article written at different grade levels. That would be an example of using materials that allow for differentiation. Um, your observations may need to be uh, thought through in advance. What is it that you're trying to measure around your lesson success? And that can come through um, a, a variety of things. Your observation of how did my lesson go? Was I able to really get to more students? Were they more engaged? And that falls right into feedback as well. If I have students who are still really with blank stares, then maybe my lesson isn't hitting like I want. Um, and maybe, maybe your observation there and the feedback you're getting will show you, I went into this class of 10 students and, you know, two days ago I taught a lesson and there were five blank stares <laughs> and today there were only two blank stares. That's feedback that shows you the differentiation is impacting what you're doing in the classroom uh, as you're trying to get more and more uh, connected to your students and engage them more and more effectively. So, you know, the do part is really where you have to have a plan, like Jen said, of the intentionality of this in the beginning. Make sure you know what you're looking for as you try some of these techniques and things that we're going to show you relative to differentiation so that you can determine, do I stick with this? Is this something I lean into or is this something I revise and retry on another uh, in another format. Right. Do you want to Jen, keep talking I, about circling back? 
No, I think you talk about circling back, don't well, you? Um, I would love to talk about circle back. <laughs> Maybe it was in that ambiguous area. So circling back is this idea of you know taking that observation and that feedback a step further. Because it's one thing to get that feedback on what you're doing, the actual activity, as Dan was saying, you know, the two less blank stares today, which Dan, let's face it, sometimes that's a win. <laughs> that's a big win. But we have to do kind of some ongoing evaluation and maybe some redesign. So, you know, we, we refer to it as many people do plan C instruction. You know, your, your plan A is the curriculum and, and all its well-intentioned glory and how it's set up, but then you got to go in and you got to take it apart and make it fit the needs of your classroom. That's plan B. But maybe we need to talk about some plan C. Maybe we need to talk about some ongoing evaluation and redesign because that's where we learn best, right? That's where we can kind of hone our craft, so to speak. So we want to set you up really well with some resources to do all of these things. So Dan, I'm going to put you on the spot while I continue to talk as we go on here and ask you to pull up the actual copy of this guide. Do you have that handy? I do. Okay. Well, we wanted to, it was really, really important to us, you know, as, as Dan and I have had the, it's been a pleasure for me to work with Dan over the last couple of years and really looking at resources that are well-researched, but they also go beyond the why. We've given you a lot of why today, but we want to put some how resources in your hands, some real world ways to address these differentiated needs. And we've shown you the model, but here is the 3D differentiated guide, how to plan and create engaging instruction for all adult learners. And this resource is full of simple but intentional, back to that word, intentional activities and approaches that in all areas we have touched on today, as well as some lesson guides and some reproducibles that are fully available for you to use at will because our desire is to put these tools into your hands. So as Dan opens up that book, I'm going to go ahead and put our link in the chat for the first time today. Oh, I beat you there. I beat yeah. you. Oh, did you? You beat yeah. me? Oh, well, you were talking first. So. <laughs> well, I'm going to be second. I'm going to put it there again. <laughs> That's your link to sign up as if you missed it in the beginning, Dan reiterated, this is an absolutely free resource. We just want to partner with you all. We see you and we want to be your champion. So we want to, to give you those resources for free. So you can access those there at that site. Absolutely. And so I've just um, scrolled forward here a little bit on the document. So again, this is around 66 pages. Uh, we are having them printed right now. So if you see us at conferences or other things like that, we'll have some physical copies. Uh, that link will take you to a place where you can download this guide. So you can read it online or you can print it. Uh, there's no uh, reason you can't take it to a printer and have it printed in a, in a hard copy for yourself as well. Um, we don't limit you in that uh, respect. And so you can see that um, this table of contents really mirrors in, in large part, the, but at much more depth, what we've talked to you about today. So there's an introduction on you know, the, the, the terms, why we're doing this, who we're doing it for, and then it goes in depth into the discover design and do elements along with circling back. And then in part three, you're gonna see some scenario-based templates that will give you some examples of how you can use the tools in your own classroom. So let's go down to page 16 and look a little bit at chapter four on the discover section. Sure, so what we tried to do here was to really dive into, again, some of the high level elements that we've talked about today and why these elements are important in discover, design, and do, but not stop there to give you some specific activities, some hands-on activities. And Dan, can you bump up just that one page right before, I believe, I wanted to draw their attention, yes. <laughs> 
one of uh, the wonderful additions to this book brought to you by Dan, wonderful idea. He said, hey, how about we put a little icon in the guide to really bring attention to anybody who's doing distance or hybrid learning. So anytime you see this little icon with the little graduation cap and the little Wi-Fi symbol there, this is something that could easily be tailored into an activity to do in that blended hybrid or fully distance environment. And honestly, a lot of the other activities probably could as well. These were just ones that we knew would be an easy, uh, an easy maneuver there. So we have provided multiple activities in each of these areas as we break them down and you'll see them. Uh, we tried to give them cutesy little, <laughs> little phrases, finish the sentence, if I wrote the test, be honest, what would you do? All of these different activities that you can do in your class to specifically address some of these strands that are so, so important for differentiated instruction. We've given you several different evaluations, again, looking at that overall idea of learning styles, but again, then pulling back into that importance of multi-sensory learning. We've got some things in there specific to those that are working with HSE students, working toward their high school equivalency credential, and we've put all of those things within that uh, discover element as well. As we get into design, then we do the same thing. We talk about you know, some of the complexities of design, some of that intentionality, and then give you some specific tools to help you lay out that design, whether it be leveling or using tech, and we've given you some reminders along the way. You'll see a little eye icon for a visual learning element, a little ear icon for that auditory learning element, and then that kinesthetic, the hands-on learning element that, you know, we can't always put all of those things into everything that we do, but as much as we can, let's just always put that reminder, um, you know, kind of out there on our radar to try to do that. Um, we, we presented this information to our educator team and one of our educators, Dan, I don't know if you remember this, uh, she said, think alouds are back. And I said, absolutely, think alouds are back. Think alouds really, really are something that are resonating with the emerging generation of Gen Z in that they they want a guide on the side versus a sage on the stage. They want someone who says, hey, tell me how you do this. I'd like to see it. I'd like to hear it. But then I want to tell you how I do it. And I want to tell you how I would problem solve this. So think alouds really, really can be a strong instructional element, but man, are they going to give you some incredible insight back into that discovery element of who your students really are. So let's jump down to this page, I think. Wait a minute, a couple more. There we go. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting so, there. Yeah, so here's where we get to put it into practice. And, you know, still, it may seem a little intangible at this point. So we really wanted to break it down again and give you pretty much a lesson plan template to work through all of these different activities. So we've given you the template here. We've given you some reminders of the different steps, some reminders of those different elements of discover, interest, profile, and readiness, noting that very rarely are you going to be able to change up all of those things that if you can, that's great, but very, very unlikely. And that's okay. You know, sometimes it, it's just, it helps us, right? To narrow down those variables and just focus on one or two things. So as we move through discover and- Can I add one uh, thing real quick, Jen? Yeah, sure. I, I used to tune carburetors years ago and they would tell you anytime you were tuning a carburetor that you only change one thing at a time. Mm. And so I would just encourage you, there's no rush. You know, you're- the, the ideas that are in this guide are meant to help you become better educators and to impact your students. But if you do it very deliberately, if you'll take your time, change something, see what happens, look at how it impacts your, your students and you and your efficacy and what you're doing, and then try something else. You don't have to, you don't have to go from zero to a hundred in you know one day you can take this very deliberately and work through new things that you try and integrate into your classroom you'll find it really interesting 
uh, and a great way for you to actually enjoy your work more too. It's kind of like a detective work. Can I un unlock exactly what's gonna um, make the biggest difference for my students? So as Jen said, these templates have areas for all three of these things, but it doesn't mean you have to do all three of them every time. You may just focus on interest and look at how you can adjust or modify lessons or prepare lessons that would, um, that would address the interest aspect of what students are doing. And, and if you do that, more and more you'll develop bags of tricks and, and things that work for you and an understanding of how your style integrates with student style and, and you'll be a better teacher. I mean, that's the whole goal. You'll become a better teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've done the same thing with the design section. So as you're looking at, okay, what is this activity? Now that I've gotten some information about my students, what activity do I want to design based on that? What activity do I want to, to put into play? So we've reminded you again, noting back to different sections of the guide, the importance of content, process, focusing on those sensory elements, as well as the product. How are students going to show you what they have learned? And then giving you some space to jot that out. Then in the do section, we you give you a space as many lesson plans do to note any materials that you need and really jot down some in-class observations as you, you see it. There have been several different stages of my, my teaching career where I had a clipboard, I think that was permanently attached because there was so much going on that I needed to, to jot down. So we've given you a space to do that, to get that immediate student feedback. And then of course, after everything said and done, a space to then say, okay, what, what did I glean out of this? What are some considerations that I need to make if I, if I want to do this activity again? What can I do to make it better? Somebody wrote there, you know, perfecting your teaching technique there in the chat. That's, that's what this is all about, right? These mm -hmm. small little changes and just getting better today than we were yesterday. So this is the format that is all contained within the 3D differentiated instruction plan. And we didn't want to stop there. <laughs> we wanted to give you three different set scenarios uh, talking through, hey, this is what I'm dealing with in my classroom. This is an example. What would that look like as I built that out in the differentiated plan? So this first one just sets up this idea that you're teaching a group of adult students preparing for their high school equivalency exam. And you've noticed that the students are doing little, if any, exploration of their practice practice test results. I see this a lot. Well, I missed five. I guess I'll just try to do better next time. But this activity allows a formal assessment to transform into valuable differentiated instruction. And here, the discovery element that we're going to be looking at is the practice test itself. So give that formal assessment if that's something that is needed or required within your program. But pull that out. Differentiate that a little bit. You'll notice that this particular lesson isn't addressing interest or profile. And as we said, that's okay. We're just focusing on readiness right now. So that discovery section would be administering that full length practice test. And then the differentiated activity that we're proposing uh, drops into a couple of different categories. It affects the process and then both the product. So a differentiated instruction activity that might come out of this is to distribute the practice test results have the students find and highlight missed pretest questions and partner with someone who maybe missed some similar questions. And then if you wanna take it a step further, have the students write or compose similar problems for their partner or maybe for the class to check their understanding, to be able to articulate out loud what they have learned. As you move on to the do section, then that's where you would note any observations that you see as the activity is going on. Maybe you see that some students are working well with partners than others. Maybe you see some things that you could build on as far as you see some of your leaders popping out in the group and being able to really take those, those lesson needs and turn them into lesson observations. And then maybe as a consideration, after all is said and done, you circle back 
and you do a little activity. You do a little exit poll at the end where you ask students as they leave the classroom, you know, tell me one specific thing that you learned from this activity. And then maybe use some of those reflections to build future iterations of this. And Dan, I think you you had a great suggestion here, you know, to invite another colleague perhaps in the, the classroom to watch these types of activities to give you some outside feedback. Yeah, I think that's really important. And my one caveat to that is always give them something very specific to look for. Sure. I think um, getting feedback from other colleagues is important, but you don't want to just say, hey, can you come watch my class and tell me what you think? You want to say, can you come watch my class and tell me if I'm giving enough wait time for students to really engage when I ask questions? Now they have your colleague has something very specific to look at and they can give you feedback based on that. And it makes it much, uh, I think it's easier to take that because you're asking for them to do something very specific. And then I think also it gives them a point of focus instead of just scattering all over with you know, some, some teaching things are just personal to your style. Maybe you don't necessarily need an input on all of that. So I always encourage people to be very specific about what you want somebody to watch when you're inviting somebody to come in and give you that constructive criticism as well. And as hard as it might be, it's often really, really helpful to choose someone yeah. who's totally different than you, yeah. <laughs> who yeah. looks at it because we, a previous story from a previous school, we always knew there was one particular teacher. If you wanted to feel really good about yourself, you invited her to observe because she yeah. just loved everything. That was great. Yeah. You know, she had, she, she is the epitome of that hand clapping emoji, but sometimes you want somebody that comes in and, and looks at it you know, maybe with, um, you know, a more critique an eye. you know, we want that to be a positive critique, you know, positive uh, moving forward critique. Um, but yeah, I think it's super helpful to find somebody who approaches it in a completely different way than you might. Yeah. Well, good. Well, just uh, one other part of this book, if we come down, you'll see that there are multiple scenarios. So this one's on finding main idea and supporting details. And the third one is using formulas to, sh to measure shapes. So the idea was to give you some really clear examples. So you can see you know, some sketches of how you might use this three-part, four-part plan um, and, and model it for you, uh, for your classroom. And uh, Jen did a great job on that. And then kind of reviewing what differentiation is and, and uh, how you could integrate this in your classroom. So again, as we said in the very beginning, this is a tool that um, we hope you can make a lot of use out of, but you're going to have to dig into it now. What we gave you was just such a, a overview of what's in here. But if you'll really dig in and try some things, I think you'll find that it gives you a way to improve your teaching, improve your differentiation day in and day out. Um, at Essential Education, there's a number of things that we do with our technology that directly impact differentiation. You know, one of the great aspects of technology is the ability to track all that information. We talked earlier about how many students can you hold in your head, but a computer can hold an unlimited number. And so our technology and our programs allows us to track what students are showing mastery on and not showing mastery on. And you can group that then and use that information to differentiate, um, to create alignment and structure in your classroom as well. Uh, there's results reporting that uh, allows you to group students as classes or individuals to really find out what they need. So there's a lot of things that we've built into uh, our technology that are really designed specifically for differentiation. And at the back of this guide, so we gave you a little bit about that. We also gave you kind of a curriculum evaluation guide. As you're looking at curriculum that you want to use, and I saw a lot of comments earlier about workbooks and textbooks and things that you need. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a nice guide to thinking through how your curriculum can support you in differentiation. Um, a publisher like us has part of a role and you have part of a role. We have to deliver quality content. It should be interactive, something that engages the students and it should be effective, you know, and, and the training that we provide you in using it should be effective. Your role should be to define your objectives. What is it you want your curriculum to do? Um, somebody mentioned earlier about wanting more repetition. 
sometimes that's an absolutely valuable technique is repeating something enough to really understand and learn it and, and manage that process of what you're trying to get someone to accomplish. Other times you need something that's really more focused on the concept so that the concept can be applied in a variety of formats. But you have to define that. You need to know what your objectives are in the curriculum you're looking at. You need to understand how you're gonna implement it. What are your goals? Is it for everybody? Is it for just a few students? And then you need to do the work to learn whatever that curriculum is and how it's input. So we. We provide you kind of a five-step plan here, a little checklist, so you can look at questions that will help you understand whether or not um, the programs are set up to differentiate instruction. And then we also identify in the back of the guide some of the key resources that we've developed for you. These are all free of charge as well. We have our measurable skill gains accelerators. Uh, those are great tools for pacing guides to help students make uh, MSGs. Uh, we have a full guide on distance education, implementing distance education. We do live webinars that are training and professional development all the time uh, through essential education. When you sign up for that uh, guide that we put the link in the chat, you'll get added to our list and, and you can unsubscribe if you want. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, notifications when we do these professional development webinars. These are not meant to be sales presentations. We're really trying to provide you uh, tools and, and support that will help you in the classroom. So all of that's embedded in the book. And uh, hopefully as you work through it, you'll find uh, pieces that you can integrate into your classroom and uh, use successfully uh, day in and day out to help your students move forward and progress. And I just want to say a personal thanks to Jen because she did so much work on this guide to create it, to research it, to put it together, to design how it would work together. And I think when you look for tools as a teacher that you can use in a scalable way in your classroom, I think you're gonna find a lot of great stuff in here. So thanks, Jen, for all the hard work you did in, in putting this together. Thank you for the collaboration and the support. It's so nice to be a part of a team that, that really sees our students and that really sees the educators that stand in the gap for those students. And um, we, we don't want to come alongside you with more high level, as my grandma would say, hoity toity <laughs> concepts, although there's value in that as well. We really want to put the tools in your hands and um, we're very passionate about doing that. So I'll give you a little plug for our December session that we have coming up, our Tuesdays with Essential Education. We're really going to dig into what it looks like to move from just giving your students examples of content in the classroom to truly giving them exemplary models and differentiation will be a huge factor within that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, um, a couple of people had asked about resources from Essential Ed. If you go to essentialed.com slash educators, uh, you can review all of our different uh, tools and services and products up there. And we're glad to set up time to meet with anyone to show them through more of that. Um, there's also a bunch of other uh, guides on there that you can, as I said, free resources that you can download. Uh, we look forward to working with you in any, any manner of ways that you allow us the honor to do that. And we thank you again for just the great work you do day in and day out. Uh, I always say, as you work with students, you are literally creating a legacy of change in the communities you work with. As, as an individual changes, it impacts their families, their friends, their communities, and that's what really brings us together and, and helps us move forward as a people. And you do a great job, oftentimes not given near the credit you deserve, but uh, we thank you for everything you do and hope you find these things useful. Thank you very much. James, I guess we toss it back to you for a co -aid close. All right, Dan and Jen, that was an awesome presentation. Um, fantastic. I don't know what else I could say, but I really enjoyed listening to it from behind the scenes. Um, I want to thank you again. Thank you, Essential Education, for uh, hosting this for us. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, a replay of this, if you didn't get a chance to join us, uh, will be hosted on uh, coabe.org within 24 hours of the completion of today's webinar. So you can access it again there if you want to watch it again. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week, great day, and uh, 
until next time. Thank you very much.